Sir. Okay. So we're good to go. Okay. We're good to go. Good morning. Today is Tuesday, February 11th, 2014. This is a regular meeting of the Los Angeles Board of Police Commissioners. Madam Secretary, please call the roll. Thank you. Good morning. Let the record reflect. Commissioners Soberoff, Figueroa Villa, Kim, and Saltzman are present, and we have a quorum. Number one on our agenda is commission comments. Sandra? Uh, yes. I, the, the officer that was injured in Reseda yesterday, um, on behalf of our commission, I'm, we hope for a speedy and full recovery. Also for the officer that was in the car accident on the two freeway that was near where I live. Um, and I did a ride along at Rampart and I, because that's been my my station for many many years and I hadn't been there in probably 10 years and I was very happy I'm very happy to report nothing I went in with a different <laughs> with a perception that I was it was going to be very busy and it was not busy the most that was going on was a mass bicycle ride and I learned about safety issues um, regarding that so thank you chief I, it was um, <coughs> I can go back and say that that Rampart is one of the safest I think Hollenbach is the busiest now I have a different perception so thank you Mr. Kim just really quickly um, I, I had a visit to Pacific Division recently and also um, did a ride along and, and I wanted to publicly thank the folks over there for welcoming me <coughs> um, and educating me on what they do um, I, I, I met for quite some time with um, officers in the vice unit and uh, Lieutenant um, Steve Lurie was a really terrific host for me and um, and Sergeant Skinner as well so I just wanted to express my thanks great Mr. Saltzman okay um, let's see yesterday I went to the uh, getting down in the in the weeds here went to the uh, supply um, what's it called? The de over at uh, Piper Tech. Piper Tech. Yeah, and uh, also to uh, internal investigations over at the Bradbury Building, and uh, same same observations. Committed people doing uh, a lot more work than uh, because of uh, because of uh, vacant positions, but getting the job done. Um, I want to say it, um, and be <coughs> very clear that uh, my relationship with Chief Charlie Beck is mutually honest, open, mature, and respectful. If we were both wearing on-body cameras for the last six months, we could prove it quickly and definitively, but we weren't. Does that mean we must agree on everything all the time? Of course not. And that's by design of the city charter of the city of Los Angeles. It's also articulated within the consent decree transition documents. We have different jobs with different responsibilities and the same goal and the same end game. We all want a safe city by virtue of great community policing. From the consent decree release documents, and I want to quote because it's important to keep this at the front of our, uh, front of our minds over everything else. LAPD has become the national and international policing standard for activities that range from audits to handling of the mentally ill to many aspects of training to risk assessment of police officers and more. The crime numbers that are released here publicly every week validate that statement. The commission, this commission's support of caring about and appreciating the members of the Los Angeles Police Department, both sworn and civilian, does not require 100% agreement on every issue all the time. 
and our support for, caring about, and appreciation of the, wor of the work and the person, Chief Charlie Beck, does not either. So on we go, working towards an even safer city with even better community policing, with even better training, with even more lessons learned, and hopefully with even more money. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to item number two on the agenda is the report of the Chief of Police, Chief Beck. Good morning, Commissioners, uh, and uh, thank you very much for your support. You know, I want to uh, echo uh, what our President says. You know, the, uh, the test is not whether we agree on everything, it's whether we uh, are, the, are the balance to each other, and, uh, and that is uh, proven uh, no better than in the, the events of the last few weeks. You know, uh, we support, support each other, we see each other's roles, the maturity of this Commission to understand that we both uh, have uh, different roads to, to follow that lead to the same goal is very, very important. I want to also uh, thank the Commission for recognizing uh, the valor of, uh, of our police officers in West Valley Division, uh, responding to uh, uh, the reports of a man with a gun who had already committed uh, one attempt murder. As our officers responded, uh, he attempted to kill them and nearly succeeded. Uh, one officer was uh, hit by a fragment of a bullet that traveled uh, immediately through his windshield directly in front of him uh, it was just by the grace of God that he was not fatally wounded. Uh, I talked to him yesterday. He's in uh, remarkable spirits, uh, has a tremendous attitude, uh, looks forward to returning to work very quickly. And, uh, you know, I, I couldn't be more pleased of, of the way he handled this and, and also the way that uh, uh, the command and, and the rest of the officers in, in, uh, in West Valley handled it. So, you know, we have been um, extremely fortunate over the last few years uh, in, in uh, not losing a Los Angeles police officer on the streets of Los Angeles, and, and I hope that good fortune continues. And, and that good fortune is a result of hard work, good training, uh, adequate deployment, and, and cops that know their jobs. So I, I think that's something that cannot be overstated. Uh, on to my report on crime. We are uh, beginning the uh, second month of the year, so we're, we're starting to see some figures that are fairly solid. Uh, tremendous reduction in homicide so far this year. Uh, we're at a 41% reduction uh, versus last year. Of course, you know, it, it, is, it is very new in the year. To give you an idea what that means, in 2013, which of course was our lowest homicide year since the mid-60s, we had 29 homicides by this time. Uh, so far, uh, year to date, we have 17. Uh, so, uh, you know, a good start, and hopefully the, these numbers uh, hold true. Uh, <clears throat> rapes, we show uh, just under 5% decrease. Uh, robbery is the one category of Part 1 crime that is up very slightly, uh, less than 1%. Uh, the total is seven incidents. Aggravated assaults are down 8.6%. Total violent crime reduction compared to last year is 4.5% and compared to 2012 is uh, almost 19%. Property crime uh, down in all four categories. Uh, total property crime reduction so far year to date is 13%. Um, so far total part one crime, that's the aggregate, is 11.8% reduction <clears throat> compared to 13 and 17% compared to 12. Shots fired uh, are down, numbers of victim shots are down, number of victim shot are down. Part one crime is down in all four bureaus. Uh, Gang-related crime is uh, down a total of uh, uh, 19 percent uh, so far year to date, and 29 percent compared to uh, 2012. Uh, tax on police officers are up slightly. Uh, Officer-involved shootings are are down significantly. Personnel statistics. We have 9,874 uh, sworn personnel on payroll and 38 recruits in the academy who are not on payroll. Uh, that puts us at 99.12 in the aggregate. Uh, reserves, 267 level 1s, 21 two, level 2s, 189 level 3s, 371 specialist volunteers, 38 chaplains. We have 2,807 civilian personnel. 540 civilian vacancies and 4,005 
uh, cadets approximately. And uh, Chief Basinger tells me that the new class of cadets uh, numbers almost 700. So we'll be looking forward to that graduation and adding them to our ranks. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Item number three on the agenda is the report of the Executive Director, Mr. T. Fink. Good morning, Mr. President, members of the Commission. Uh, two brief items. Uh, first, item 10C in closed session will be continued to uh, next Tuesday, February 18th, uh, 2014. And item uh, 8D is in David on the open agenda. A page was missing from the Department's report. Page 4 is a copy of it has been placed in front of each of you and given to the Board Secretary and also placed in the public agenda book at the back of the room. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Item number four on the agenda is the report of the Inspector General, Mr. Bustamante. Thank you, Commission. I have nothing. Okay, moving on to item number five, which consists of information items and filed items relative to noise variances and special event permits submitted for the period ending February 7th, 2014. Item number six, do we have any presentations? Not today. Okay. Item number seven is the consent agenda items. These items are considered to be routine and non-controversial, upon which the board is provided with adequate information for approval without inquiry or discussion. Would a commissioner wish to pull any items as special for discussion 7A through 7C? We have approval of items 7A through 7C. Second. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Okay. We are now on item number eight, regular agenda items. Item 8A is a verbal presentation. Would a commissioner wish to pull any item from 8B through 8D, a special for discussion? Uh, I'd like to briefly discuss item 8D and move approval of items 8A, 8B, and 8C. For a second. Second. Is there a second? We have second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, great. Okay, we will begin with 8A, Department's verbal report and discussion regarding the status of the predictive policing project. Morning, gentlemen. Morning. Good morning. Good. Fred Pole. Good morning, commissioners. Good morning, chief. Morning. I'm going to give an overview of uh, the state of predictive policing and then. Uh, my friend and colleague, Captain Malinowski, is going to give the, uh, the view of an area commanding officer who's uh, embraced uh, predictive policing. As you may know, uh, predictive policing as a, as a term was coined in, in 2008 in a journal article on public policy written by then Lieutenant Sean Malinowski and, and Chief uh, Bratton. Since that time, a lot of work uh, with Captain Malinowski and the uh, mathematicians at at UCLA, and we've arrived at a, a predictive model that uh, that works. And while we were not the first uh, to uh, to activate predictive policing, that that goes actually to the city of Santa Cruz. We were second, just a few months uh, behind them. the uh, The premise of of predictive policing is that if crime can be predicted, then it can be prevented and it can be disrupted and the effects can be, uh, can be mitigated. The model that, that we use on predictive uh, policing relies on years and years of crime data, 10 years precisely, and it works on the, on the when and the where and not the who of, of who does uh, crime in Los Angeles. And therefore, it's not a it's not an overall solution to crime. We still need officers on the street making good decisions, good consensual encounters, stops based on reasonable suspicion, and, and arrests. And so it, it really does not take the decision making away from the, uh, from the police officer or from the uh, commanding officer. It works on, on very high math, uh, well above my academic achievement, but uh, high math and very small boxes and the size of the, of the box that we patrol is uh, important because we could put a 500 mile square box around the city and it would not be useful for patrol. It would be 100% in its predictions but not useful. And so the idea is that we get the boxes smaller and smaller and, and that uh, when we're able to uh, isolate crime in those smaller boxes, that's an indication that the algorithm is working and, and not chance. The box size is a half acre? 
it's about three uh, three football fields. Yes, I, yeah. 500, 500 feet, feet by 500 that. feet. And that is what we're currently using. We can go larger, we can go smaller, but at, uh, at present, that's what we believe is, is the, uh, the best size box. So every part of the city of Los Angeles has a box, and we, can, we have uh, rows upon rows and columns upon, upon columns, and we end up with tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of boxes. But again, that's not, uh, that's not useful for patrols, so we, in the areas, we isolate the top 10, 15, or 20 boxes, what an area commanding officer can... It's about five, I'm, I'm wrong, it's about five acres. It's um, 500 by 500, did you say? 500 by 500. Feet. That is about five acres. So that's 250,000. Oh, it's, what? Come on, you got it. Wait, the guy right back there. What? <laughs> it's an acre. Yeah, okay. But, uh, but this is, the 500 by 500 box is 250,000 square feet which is about five acres. That's right, about yeah. five acres. Come on, I want to agree with that guy. <laughs> Figure it out and then come up to the microphone. So I'm a real estate guy. If I'm off on this, I'm really <laughs> screwed. Yeah. So okay. in, every, in every area, we're giving the, uh, the officers 10, 15, or, or 20 boxes what they, can, uh, what they can reasonably handle. And those boxes... Uh, move around depending on the crime that we're trying to predict. And we currently predict three crimes in the city of Los Angeles. We predict burglary, auto theft, and burglary and theft from motor vehicle. Hmm. And, and no other crimes at present, although uh, that, could, that could change. Those crimes together represent about half, a little over half, of all Part 1 crimes in Los Angeles. So it's a really good uh, selection for trying to impact uh, part one crimes. And I'm gonna pass off to, uh, to Captain Malinowski to talk about how it, it looks on the, uh, at the street level. So in uh, Foothill area, we, we started with predictive policing uh, in a pilot in November of 2011. Uh, those three crime types were chosen because they fit a, re a theory, criminological theory of repeat victimization, especially burglary, we know. And the numbers bear that out, that the location that's burglarized has a much higher incidence of re-victimization within two weeks. So this is a near-repeat model that we use. And as a practical matter in patrol, we have a, two maps per day published, uh, one for day watch. It covers 12 hours. It puts out 20 uh, 500 by 500 foot boxes for patrol so that during their discretionary time, uh, patrolling instead of a more random patrol or using only instinct they're they're able to hit the boxes that have the highest mathematical probability of a crime occurring in that 12-hour time period then we track how much time they spend there they change their status on the MDC to show that they're in the box they're still available for calls during that period but the clock is running so then I get a report every Monday that tells me how many minutes and how many hours by basic car uh, we've spent and what we're seeing is that if you spend somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 70 hours per week of uh, targeted patrol in those boxes, you see some kind of impact. Um, and when we've deviated from the plan, you know, when we've changed the number of boxes, or last year I put two boxes per basic car. It turns out if you put two boxes per basic car, they're not the highest probability boxes for the division. And so we lost ground when we did that little experiment. Now we're back to the basics of uh, 20 boxes for the whole area, and uh, we're seeing the results year to date here. Again, during the test period in six months that we did a rigorous scientific test, we were down 12% um, in the combined three crimes, and burglary was down dramatically, 25%. So just as far as numbers, that's 22 fewer burglaries per month. Um, did they? Did they? Did people go outside the box? In other words, did burglaries go up around the boxes? You know, we look at that. We, we looked at, um, you know, the phenomena of displacement yeah. and what we found in, instead of displacement, and we looked at the recent literature on it, what we're seeing is the conditions don't um, persist outside. These boxes are like a cherry patch for a criminal, and they cannot easily move that a block over if the police are there. So what we see in the latest literature is a diffusion of benefits. So if you have a 500 by 500 foot box, you're really getting benefit out to about 1,000 feet is what the mathematics uh, professors are telling me. So we had big reductions, um, and this year, year to date, now that we're back to a very disciplined approach and we're actually spending about 80 hours a week in a box, 
I'm seeing big reductions. For instance, on burglary year to date, I'm down 60%. As far as raw numbers, that goes from 70 crimes at this time last year to 28 this year. Uh, and then same thing with GTA and, and burglary from motor vehicle down 24% and GTA and down 27% and the other. So that's 65% of my crime problem. I'm getting big bites out of those uh, crimes year to date. And so that's really driving our crime reduction. And it's just part of doing business for the officers now. The only mission they get is the predictive policing mission. So you, they take the 5,100 or so boxes that make up my division. They concentrate on 20 of them. The, those 20 represent less than 1% of my land mass, but over 6% of my crime. So why wouldn't you be in the areas where you have the highest probability? Yeah, tell me how, with Comstat, the interrelationship of predictive policing, um, how Comstat makes it more effective, or is it, do you get mixed messages, or is it complementary or supplementary? No, I think it's complementary. We, we still do, like uh, my partner John said, we still uh, do focus on patterns when they come up. And we still do focus on individuals or, that are responsible for those patterns. And so you, you can't just kind of put this on um, autopilot. So you do have to make sure your leadership is getting the officers to put out a net, if you think of it that way. It's like a preventive net to these particular boxes. And then crimes bleed through. And you have to go after those crimes. And remember, violent crime is, is not impacted by this. So Sean still has to deal with violent crime in the, in the, in the ComStat model. Correct. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, I'm trying to understand. So the variables that, um, that the formula considers, it's mostly geographic based. Yes, it's you, all, it, the, uh, the only data in there is the crime type, the location, mm -hmm. longitude, longitude and latitude, and the time, time of day and, and the day itself, the date. Mm -hmm. So the other um, uh, additional um, factors that, that you, you just mentioned, um, uh, individuals and criminal variety. profiling. Yeah, that, right. that kind of, that's more. That's we don't include that. that, right? We don't, <clears throat> we don't include that in the algorithm, but we do when when it comes to Comstat. We still have that kind of right. problem solving that we need to do. Right. And I should tell you too, there's problem solving that goes on in these boxes. We have impromptu community meetings where we'll go out there and pull a whole. Uh, uh, put a, com a command post vehicle out there, we'll have 40 or 50 people, and we're occupying that space for an hour, and we're also educating people about the fact that that and, box represents and, a risk. And so the boxes shift depending on when patterns are identified, and that's, that's how it, how it yes. works. Yes, the, the boxes can actually shift in uh, minute to minute in real, in real time, but in reality, the, the number one box is usually very stable, and the number 20 box is the one that's more likely to move around. And so as you, as you point and click on the screen and you, you can turn off burglary and, and burglary and theft for motor vehicle, just go to auto theft and the boxes will change. So you can really target in on, on those uh, specific crimes and times of day. And has there been discussion to, or can this model extend to other kinds of crimes, or, or has, has there been discussion about that, or mm -hmm. future plans? We are looking at uh, expanding to shots fired and shooting victims, and there's been some uh, requests for expansion to, to traffic, and really it all depends on how, how much uh, buy-in we can get and how much we can reasonably overlay onto the things that other people are already doing. And has the data, background data demonstrated that this model is effective for, for those kinds of crimes? In, in other jurisdictions, they, ha they are using it for, for violent crime. And in uh, the United Kingdom, for instance, they use it for public disorder. They're able to predict. Um, and then uh, traffic, we're just starting to dip our toe into that. But the early indications by the mathematicians is it should be uh, almost more more easily forecast than than the crime itself. And, and, and what is the community response if if the this model results in increased policing in certain boxes in certain areas or has, has that been attention at all? No, you know we have. Uh, I think the thing that's helped us is we go out to the community meetings and talk about. Exactly. We go through this same process where we talk about it, and then we do the impromptu meetings in the boxes, and there are a lot of questions at those, at those meetings, as you can imagine. But no, I haven't gotten anything at the, in the area CEO's office the, to indicate that people are uncomfortable with it. Usually they like to see us there. Sure, it's a deployment issue. Yes. Right? Correct. Yes. Mr. President, we do have seven public comment cards. Does anybody else, um, any other, anyone else have questions? Very good. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, the Thank first you. three public comment cards are Michael Novick, Pete White, and Jeff. 
corner. Um, I think that if you believe that this is only about uh, stopping uh, residential burglaries and uh, thefts from cars, you're kidding yourselves as the leading edge of the wedge. Uh, I can predict a lot of criminality in this city. I can predict, for example, based on 30 years' experience, that the LAPD will be killing about a dozen people and shooting about 50 people in the course of a year. I can predict that if there's going to be crime happening in, in Los Angeles, it's crime in the suites. And that, uh, you know, over at some of these bank headquarters that there are crimes being hatched right now that over at uh, uh, LA Unified, they, uh, you know, are figuring out how to uh, break the rules governing uh, 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 bond money for uh, fixing up schools and using it to spend it on uh, uh, computers from Apple. And uh, I can predict that, uh, you know, this uh, um, board will turn a blind eye to what's going on. Uh, I think that, uh, you know, this reminds me very much of uh, the period in the uh, 1800s when retroactively they came up with scientific racism to justify the uh, uh, racialized slavery and, and uh, 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 colonization, occupation, and genocide of Native people. And I think that the basis of this so-called predictive policing is about trying to predict, as the man said, they're using it to predict public disorders in the United Kingdom. Well, I can predict that there'll be a lot of public disorder if this system continues trying to rip off people and steal people's lifeblood to maintain institutions like the LAPD. Thank you. Pete White. I think the quote, I am Pete White, I think the quote of the day for me was high, high math and small boxes um, and something about not really understanding the science. However, we are talking about deploying this model um, in communities, and we know which communities this model will be deployed in. Um, and a Yale study uh, that was commissioned by um, the ACLU utilizing LAPD data, it illustrated that rates of crime across race and ethnicity were nearly equal. However, stop rates, detention, arrest rates skyrocketed amongst people of color, particularly African Americans. LAPD Post Breton has made it a practice of creating new language. So instead of having racial profiling, you can't report that anymore. It's called constitutional policing. That essentially creates a legal framework to justify rights violations in these communities. High math, small boxes. I would love to hear a breakdown of who you've netted um, in that area when you talk about there's no criminal profiling. I would love to hear more about these community meetings um, that you're going to. We've, in the Skid Row community, we've been calling for y'all to come out and Chief Beck, uh, who used to be the captain, Chief Beck of uh, Central Division, who, who refuses to come out. And so we say no to predictive policing. We say we want to hear more about this cost. And we say public safety isn't defined by these new crazy models. It's defined by ensuring the resources that the, the mass resources that come into LAPD are redirected into our schools, into job development, into things that truly make us safe. We predict that that won't happen unless people in our communities stand up and make sure it happens. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Jeff Warner, followed by Jamie Garcia, Hamid Khan, and Jabril Mohammed. Yeah, I'm Jeff Warner, 3785 Wilshire Boulevard, 90010. Uh, I have some experience with data analysis. I spent 40 years as a research scientist in academia, NASA, and Chevron research. And when I listened to the talk about pre predictive policing and its successes, I worry about the thing that, the biggest trap that scientists can fall into, and that's self-delusion. So there's no doubt in my mind that we heard the truth that when more police are deployed to a box, that affects how people live there. And crime, and crime is de decreased, and so is people's quality of life is decreased to some extent. So what I ask is that you people be a little bit slow about how predictive policing is, uh, it's already adopted, but spread throughout the 
department and you make sure there are really controlled experiments or controlled uh, studies so that you really know it is, it is working. And it's not just that because you throw more police at one area that reduces crime. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, um, Katie Crodford from the director of American Civil Liberties Union of Massachusetts Technology for Liberty Project warns against the trend toward data and statistical software as a panacea. People are excited about technological solutions for vexing social problems, Crawford says. This technophilia that has taken over, people assume if a computer is involved, then it's smarter, more efficient. It seems like we're moving in, she continues to say, it seems like we're moving in the wrong direction in how we think about crime. Instead of figuring out why people are robbing houses, we are paramilitarizing our police, turning them into robocops who take directions from computers as to how to go about their day. As Katie Crawford states, the belief in technology to solve crimes in communities negates the fact that policing in itself is inherently biased against people of color, especially those of African descent and poor people. Predictive policing is deceptive and problematic because it presumes that the data input and algorithms are neutral. The accuracy of poli uh, predictive policing programs depend on the accuracy of the information they are fed. It promotes racial profiling. Just as we see in the suspicious activity reporting program, in the Inspector General's audit of March 2013, we see that SARS are collected on mostly people of color. So we see that changing the tool for capturing criminals doesn't take away how policing affects certain communities. I, as a registered nurse, believe that in order to heal people, we need to understand what needs they have, whether it is for food, shelter, medical, or mental health care, or community centers, we need to understand that no form of policing with or without computers or databases will bring the, the peace our communities deserve. Thank you. Thank you. Hamid Khan. Hi, good morning. Uh, Hamid Khan with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. So here, as a part of a much larger surveillance apparatus that LAPD has laid out, which is an extension of and a very uh, a critical part of NSA, uh, is now this whole, uh, which has been called snake oil gadgetry that is being used. And we're kind of looking at this, predicting this RoboCop type future that, you know, people would know exactly where crime is going to happen. Uh, Commissioner Kim raised this issue of geographic based variables. It's very interesting that how these variables have been working because in essence we, we know what the war on drugs has done because predictive policing is only as accurate as the information that is inputted into these databases and we know the disparity in sentencing we know the, the racial profiling we know the inherent racism in many other you know policies that we face just looking at a couple of things uh, Philip Stark who's the chair of statistics department of UC Berkeley reviewed documents and evaluated things of about policing uh, about predictive policing and and he says that I'm less than convinced. He says, first of all, the issue is, and I quote, a comparison of the same jurisdiction to itself means nothing. If you're going to do this, you're going to have to have a comparable city with predictive policing. You cannot just say that. There's all, the Commissioner Soboroff talked about CompStat model, where Bill Bratton was talked about the champion of CompStat and reducing crimes in the 90s, while L.A. was going through a reduction in crimes in the 90s as well. So in a way, we're just kind of basing ourselves on this as completely, again, I'd say snake oil ga gadgetry, which leads to racial profiling, and again, people of color and poor communities are going to be impacted. Jeffrey Ratcliffe, who's the chair of the Temple University's Department of Criminology, says, is that predictive policing is not proven by a stretch, and we cannot go down that road. We have another, Ed Smith, who's a criminologist and a veteran police officer, and he's done uh, a, an, uh, a whole study of 156 cities, and, there's, and they're saying there's actual no da little data at all that predictive policing works. So it is not just about, you know, I mean, people really reaching out to you and saying that it's a waste of resources. It's about racial profiling, and we're going down this road that we're going to look back and see that this snake oil gadgetry has to stop. Thank, Thank you, sir. You. Thank you. Jabal Mohammed. Good morning, Commissioners, Chief. Uh, this is Jabal Mohammed for Bismillah, the Justice Movement. Um, here again, we're drawing the line between um, the department and the people. And the people are the best police, if you ask me. They're, they are concerned about themselves more so than anyone else. So, uh, But here, here again, uh, predictive, it sounds so much like prejudice, 
It sounds so unconstitutional uh, in that it deprives me of my equal rights and my due process. You are predicting, you are profiling, and you are targeting. We need to reanalyze or make another analysis or look at this again because it's predicated on prejudice, your own admissions. You're predicting that someone is going to commit a crime. It's, they predict football games. They predict baseball. It sounds like a board game. We need to be cautious of how we orchestrate our efforts to remedy, okay? Uh, this one here, the language, although the results are favorable, okay, but we know how things are, uh, how can I say, um, are fully designed for the sake of those who are making the reports. And no disrespect to the uh, Malinowski and uh, Mr. Romero, but we're just saying we have to look at this in the face of what it actually says to us that we're predicting that people are going to commit a crime and that creates a prejudice. Thank you, sir. And the final comment card on this item is Quasi Ruma. Morning. Morning. Take your time. Thank you. My name is Quasi Nkrumah. I'm the co-chair of the Martin Luther King Coalition of Greater Los Angeles. Um, ever since 9-11, we have accelerated uh, the process of uh, tightening up of all kinds of, of security measures, policing policies, et cetera, et cetera. And a lot of this has intersected with this increase of dependency on digital technology. This is a very dangerous and difficult path for us to follow. Benjamin Franklin once said that any society that trades its liberties to increase its security will generally end up losing both. You know, I, I think that that's, that's very, very correct. And I draw from the fact that uh, back when Reagan was, was in office and there was massive unemployment, I was, I was living on the East Coast in an industrial city, uh, Baltimore. There was, in fact, a massive increase of crimes of all types well, with the increase of, of unemployment in our communities. Um, and I was dealing with a group that was, in fact, trying to grapple with a lot of, of these issues. There was a study done in, in Detroit that kind of graph charted this stuff out. And it was true. It was true science. In recent years, with the massive unemployment that's hit our communities, with the economic crisis, with people losing their homes, with the increase of homelessness in our, our communities. Predictably, the 19% decrease in crimes of, of uh, for example, ga gang uh, crimes and the other decreases in crimes are counterintuitive. If we are looking only at what the machines are telling us is going to happen, we're going to make a huge mistake. I mean, in Echo Park, for example, uh, you know, gang warfare is, is, is down probably b uh, prior to what it was in the mid-1950s, but yet a, a, a gang injunction was proposed for our, our neighborhood. I just think that there needs to be a lot more thought about how these policies are, are enacted and what they do in terms of producing predictable patterns of racial profiling, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And that is the final comment card, Mr. President. We will now move to item 8D, department's report dated February 4th, 2014, relative to the status update on the department's 2013-2014 fiscal year annual audit and inspection plan. Good morning. Welcome. Hey. With me today I have Jeff Phillips, police performance auditor for. Good morning. Welcome, sir. Um, I submitted this report to update the police commission on our um, 
audit plan because we are behind and I wanted to let you know that just a little bit of history this is the first two-year plan that the department had and, and I'm responsible for it it was ambitious I knew it was ambitious when we went into it and there were things that happened during the summer with special <coughs> projects that have caused the schedule to be behind a little bit so I just wanted to let you know that um, my people are working very hard and you're gonna see us a lot in the next four months because I basically um, will have about 30, at least 33 reports coming to you, and the remaining will come in the first quarter, the end of the fourth quarter reports. Um, the other things that are happening is I'm putting together the next two-year plan, and with the lessons I learned from this one and the input I get from command staff and uh, your office and the inspector general, we'll look at what we can in reality do, and it's still gonna be ambitious, but we have some flexibility and the other thing to consider is when we look at a new um, entity it takes a lot more time and until we really get into that we don't know how long and three months is usually too short so there are a couple on um, the last part of the fiscal year audit plan that we ran into that so i open it up for any questions rob do you have a question um first i think i thank you for the presentation uh, i wanted to hold hold this just to, to get that explanation uh, and I appreciate it uh, I uh, do think the plan looks good I agree uh, it's ambitious uh, and I understand uh, how some of those things change but it's also very important and that's why I wanted to hold it the one thing I just wanted to clarify I think I know the answer to this but uh, going forward if things change so that you're not able to follow the plan uh, is part of your protocol then to, to be in communication with Mr. T. Fank so that as we're following out, we know what's happening? Absolutely. Mr. Great. T. Fank and I talk on a regular basis. Great. So Thank I will you. make sure that that happens. Thank you. I appreciate that. We have a, uh, any other questions? Let's have a motion for approval of, of 8D. Move approval of item 8D. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you. We're now on item Eight, I'm sorry, item nine. We have one public comment card. We have Jabral Mohammed. Morning again, commissioners. Morning. <laughs> um, Chief, you know, tomorrow is the, uh, the official anniversary of the shooting of the van. I was at a meeting last night at town hall. I got a chance to meet with the inspector general who was disappointed to the county. And, um, you know, he was telling me about how violence was a part of the job. Um, I was taken by the fact that uh, that he made a comment regarding the mayor, and he said that uh, the chief had given a recommendation, and the mayor disagreed with it. I'm in recluse. I haven't really gotten up exactly what that language was. But I just wanted to formally, you know, as a member of the public and a member of the community, and a member of, uh, and the Emir of Bismillah, the justice movement, I just wanted to uh, formally, as a matter of record, state, that given my ignorance in terms of what the chief recommended, that if it didn't have anything to do with the dismissal of those officers, and this goes for all officers involved in misconduct whereby um, injury, you know, I object if the chief did not fire these people. I object. Uh, these people should not be able to perpetrate violent crimes against the community and be salaried. So I'm just here. I'm compelled to come today. And I'm also asking that uh, the commission review the station tape for January 26th at the Newton Division when the mayor of the Bismillah Justice Movement made effort to become a member of the, uh, the, the CPAP. Review that tape, it was about I guess, 1,500 hours, January 26, Newton Division, 3400 um, Central Avenue. I do have uh, seven. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Seven additional comment cards. We have um, Emilio Laquez, followed by KEI, K, and Ariana Alcaraz. Thank you. 
Good morning. My name is Emilio, and I'm an organizer with the Youth Justice Coalition, Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. Uh, youth of color in Los Angeles are being targeted, profiled, surveilled on a daily basis. Policies such as Special Order 1, the iWatch program, and gang injunctions make the implementation of oppre oppressive practices front and center for our youth. Suspicious activity reporting and gang databases funnel our youth into a cycle of school to jail track, making it harder and more difficult for them to have a holistic lifestyle. Our communities have come together and have been successful in gaining public forums or hearings with the LA City Human Relations Commission around gang injunctions and su suspicious activity reporting. We urge the commission to direct the LAPD to operate with full transpar transparency, honesty, and accountability in the HRC's implementation of these hearings. We call on the LAPD to uphold the public trust and not to de derail the process of the upcoming public hearings. These are one step forward to dismantling the surveillance state and working to better our communities and improve public safety in Los Angeles. We look forward to these hearings and to educate our community members about all of these policies and how they're being carried out across the city of Los Angeles. Thank you for your time. Thank you, sir. Public hearing, public hearings are the basis of a truly democratic society if the public are listened to. And the public includes Los Angeles Community Action Network and Stop the LA Police it's a Coalition. LAPD must stop interfering with the LA <coughs> Human Relations Committee's plan to hold public hearings on the LAPD's suspicious activity report and gang injunction. Public hearings of SAR gang injunction must be independent of the LAPD. Democracy requires genuine checks and balances. The SAR and IY surveillance is an attack on civil rights and human rights activists and on youth of color, especially the poor, who did nothing to create the condition of poverty that's all over the world. Uh, it's a waste of taxpayers' money. It's a snitch program that divides a potential unified, diverse, multi-ethnic society, a truly democratic society. In a related issue, a report by the Privacy and Civil Liberties Oversight Board concluded that the government bulk collection of telephone data is not legal, is not constitutional, and is not warranted. Ariana Alcaraz. Um, okay, so a few things. Um, number one is um, last time I saw you, I was at the um, West Side. You guys had the police commission, like a community meeting there, and um, I thought it was really cool, you know, that you guys went out there. Um, however, I've never seen any of them come here and ask you to go to their community and have one. I've only seen us, and you still haven't come out or even made an effort to. Um, um, and then I want to say some stuff on predictive policing that I heard. Um, and how, like, the way that we're using, like, technology and the advancement in technology and how, you know, UCLA professors are getting in on this and, and you know, devoting so much time and, like, creating this system where you can, like, d put in crime and then, you know, have these boxes come out. And I just think, like, you know, those, that knowledge and that, that, that education could be used in something, like, t much better. Probably the city could use that to figure out you know, some, use some rigorous science and math to figure out how we get, you know, resources and money back into the things that matter in our communities and not the police department. Um, I also, uh, last thing, I ask that you rescind Special Order 1 and uh, the iWatch programs immediately, um, and that's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The next four speakers are Bilal Ali, Kwasi Ruma, Jamie Garcia, and Hamid Khan. 
I'm Bilal Ali. I'm the uh, California Statewide Coordinator for the Western Regional Advocacy Project. Uh, we stand in support with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition and the uh, move to rescind Special Order 1. Uh, <clears throat> we are committed to rescind this order because we feel that and the iWatch program because we feel that the iWatch program, Trevor Martinizes, Trevor Martinizes our communities. It causes suspicion, the same suspicion that was responsible for taking this young man's life from this self-proclaimed vigilante due to programs such as the iWatch program and its spying apparatus that's been set up. Uh, that we also believe that this is set up to target organizers and, this, uh, and those who dissent against this uh, parasitic society. As we've seen with the attacks on organizations and that, like the downtown, like the All Sanders Community Action Network, where members have been targeted by the LAPD, including myself, been thrown into jail simply for not committing any crimes, but simply called a crime to stand up against this unjust order. So we're asking the police commission to, if you do, they have that power to rescind this order, and then that way you can rescind yourselves through the lens of a rubber stamp board and a board of cronyism that's been appointed to go along with the So we ask you, if you do have power, if you are really the oversight board, the eyes of the community, you rescind this draconian uh, George Orwellian measure. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Kwasi Nkrumah, Martin Luther King Coalition, again. Um, we're very strongly supportive of the Human Relations Commission holding these hearings. As I said before, um, this computerization and digitalization uh, of information on the entire population is, has grown way out of control throughout the nation at every level. People are highly concerned about it. It's beyond time that we had serious discussion about this in our own communities, and particularly when some of this is beginning to manifest at the community level where we're living. Um, and ag again, as likewise, this has been raised by several other speakers. Uh, we think that the SARS program uh, and iWatch uh, need to be rescinded. Uh, we think that there's been a lot of discussion about humanizing uh, the LAPD's relationship uh, with communities. Uh, and healing some of the damage that's been done over the years uh, in terms of, of its relationship, uh, particularly with communities of color. Uh, and that's not going to happen as long as, as this digitalization uh, process where people's names go into computer banks uh, for minor reasons and are maintained there for years and years uh, continues. We recently had, had an experience uh, in our commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, where we engaged in a, a nonviolent civil disobedience as part of, a, of, of an action uh, on budget cuts, uh, one which we actually had made arrangements with the police department about in terms of, of, of the civil disobedience thing. Comes up later, uh, the city attorney's office designates that, that uh, our failure to move was, was from the scene of a riot. Uh, I'm told by a staff person down this, oh, well, this must have been a, a mistake in the computer. These kind of mistakes get people's names placed in databases because uh, leaving the, being part of a riot is considered terrorist activity. Look it up in the dictionary, which had nothing to do with what we were doing. So we need to humanize our approach more and digitalize it less. Thank you. Thank you. So the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition demands, demands the rescinding of Special Order 1 in the iWatch program. On October 10, 2013, the LA City Human Relations Commission passed a resolution to hold public hearings slash forums on gang injunctions, SARS, and other public safety issues. So I, be, I come before the police commission because I expect you to encourage, participate, and protect the upcoming public hearings. I expect that you will ensure that they will not be derailed. For clarity, I say hearings, and we still need to advocate for this, but I say hearings because of one particular reason. When gang injunctions and suspicious activity, report, um, re suspicious activity reporting are discussed, the only way I feel the community will get their due justice is if LAPD is subpoenaed and they testify under oath. I see the police commission as responsible for 
the full and honest participation of LAPD at these hearings. And I expect your support as we advocate for these hearings. And if we don't get your support, I expect you stay out of the way as these hearings forums begin to develop. Hello, once again, Hamid Khan with the Stop LAPD Spying Coalition. So let me just briefly map it out for you. Suspicious activity reporting, special order one, eye watch, intelligence gathering guidelines, predictive policing, electronic surveillance, stingray, trap wire, high definition cameras, joint terrorism task force, joint regional intelligence center. Uh, and then now we keep on say, seeing counterterrorism, special operations bureau, major crimes division, on and on and on and on and on. And what you are seeing is under your over site is this huge surveillance apparatus that is every day that is every day sucking in tremendous amount of resources from the communities. You've heard people talk about it, where this money should be going. But what do we have, in essence? When the Fusion Center audit came out by the U.S. Senate subcommittee, it was a scathing audit. And they said that the intelligence gathering from local law enforcement that goes to these Fusion Centers was irrelevant, duplicative, and useless. When Mike Downing, who's the head of the counterterrorism division, was even asked about that thing, his only response was, there's a lot of white noise, but an occasional gold nugget. It. But he could not point to a single conviction based on that gold nugget. So what you have is now we know about the NSA. Now we know over 23 mil trillion. A thousand million makes a billion. A thousand billion makes a trillion. 23 trillion that we know of pieces of documents. And what do we have to show? What do we have to show? Our lives are being laid bare. And then you have intelligence gathering guidelines where you can take on fake identities. That is entrapment. That is even much more insidious than what NSA is doing. So that's why we are here today to publicly remind you, you have a copy of the motion that the Human Relations Commission passed unanimously on October 10th, that LAPD and the commission is responsible that LAPD is help, is, acts in transparent ways. LAPD does not try to derail this public hearing process. LAPD needs to be under oath and subpoenaed for these public hearings to happen. And we're going to reach out you and we'll hold you accountable and we hold you obligated to, for this public demand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that is the final comment card. We are now on item number 10, closed session. The Board of Police Commissioners will now recess into closed session to discuss item numbers 10A and B in accordance with various government codes.